everybody. Welcome to Grace Church on a Wednesday night. Is that not amazing truth? Listen, I'm a child of God. If you're in Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. I mean, I know we're still servants, but no, wait. We're children, if I said sons and daughters. Now, hold on to that when I talk about the spiders tonight. Oh, I'm talking about spiders, but you gotta, you gotta hold on to that thought. Matter of fact, can I see a, just a tease for these guys, this, the picture of the spider? Whoa! You're gonna love Mr. Spider when we get to that part of the message. Good evening, everybody. Glad you're here. Uh, by the way, if you can't tell, I absolutely love Wednesday nights. It's, it's just like, it's, it's my favorite service of the week. And so if you guys were here, I'm glad you're If you weren't here, it would still be my favorite service of the week. But having you guys here makes it even better. And so just, and Thanksgiving's over, which means Christmas is coming. And then it's going to be 2019. Can I, you know, I, I actually hope the Lord comes before Christmas. Wouldn't that be something if, uh, if he comes? And if you're Ruth Parker, you're thinking, well, I've been talking about that my whole life. And she's had a long life. <laughs> and I've, they've been talking about that with me since like 1976. The first time I really, Jack Van Impey in 1976. It's been a long time since 1976. But one thing I know, we are one day closer to that truth than we were yesterday. And one day... One day, that trumpet will sound, and one day, the rapture is going to happen. Amen. Now, in case you're new to our church, you say, you don't really believe that, do you? Oh, yes, I do. You say, well, why would you believe that? Well, see, I also believe the Christmas story. And up until the Christmas story happened, nobody thought that was going to happen either. I mean, it had been 400 years since God had talked to anybody. And so, until he talked to Mary... Gabriel, and then sure enough, all those ancient prophecies from those historical ancient documents came true, literally, literally. That's why you get a Christmas card. That's why we put lights. Did you see the lights on the front of our building? Did you notice that? If you didn't see them, when you go out, look back at the lights and go, oh, and then they'll all be down this side. And then you go, oh, and you say, why are you doing that? Because it's Christmas, and we want our neighborhood to know. By the way, we are a city on a hill. Literally, we are a church on the hill. Highest point in Amarillo is right out there. In case you didn't know it, go out and check. Just stand in the middle of that intersection and jump up and down. You'll be the highest. <laughs> wow, I heard that Wow. Hey, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians for our scripture reading tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's going to be on page 1323. If you're new to our church, make sure you grab a, a seat back Bible. Follow along with me. We're going to cover a lot of stuff tonight. But I, I want you to see that I'm not making this stuff up. I'm actually getting it right out of the Bible as we go through the Gospel of Luke. And so when God slams you tonight, whether he's comforting you or convicting you, you'll know that I wasn't gunning for you. That's just where we're at in the Word of God. Amen? And so everybody here is going to get hit with something tonight. And you say, I'm not going to get hit tonight. Woo, look out. I, I bet you do. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for the scripture reading. I know you've been standing, but would you stand in respect to the word of God as we read verse 50, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. A amen for the word of God before I read it. Amen. This is what the word of God, here's what the word of God says. Now, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot, it cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead, can I hear you say dead? The dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written way back in Hosea chapter 13. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death. Can I hear you say death? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us, Grace Church, Wednesday night, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, come on, you guys can do better than that. That because of Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, he took my place. He conquered my death, my sin, my hell. He conquered that. And in him, I'm resurrected. And in him, one day, I will be physically resurrected. I, I, I happen to believe I'll be buff in heaven. <laughs> now, I might get there and be wrong, but it won't matter. I do know this. I'll have a celestial body, Amen. and you'll have a celestial body. You know that thing your old body keeps crying out for? Well, I want your body to work. I, I, God wants your body to function, but your body's not celestial yet. Oh man, I'm getting excited and yes, we need Jesus. By the way, can I see the sermon title? I'm already ahead of myself and we're not done finishing. Oh, Jesus, he's actually the expert at raising the dead. Uh, Todd left out Jesus, I'll say that, but Jesus should be up there. Jesus is the expert at raising dead things. You mean dead people? No, I mean dead things. Jesus is an expert at raising dead things. You know, like if there's a guy in the graveyard, living in the graveyard, he ain't dead, but he's hanging out with all kinds of dead things. Did you know my Savior will go into a graveyard and find the guy hanging out with all, in, he's living in the tombstones. Remember that sermon two weeks ago? My, my Jesus will go into a dead place to bring out life. Well, I thought that's talking about like, Dead. Well, it is talking about dead. But you can be spiritually dead and be here tonight. My Savior is great at showing up with spiritually dead people. They don't have life in them yet. They don't have Christ in them yet. He knows how to do that. Amen? Amen. Matter of fact, I've been to a couple churches that are dead. You say, no. Yes, I've been to churches that are dead. And he's really great at taking live things out of dead churches. You say, can't prove that. Go to Boxville Brothers. I used to be the pastor, youth pastor, at Boxville Brothers Funeral Home. It used to be a church, and it was dead. Today, it's really dead. I ain't making it up. That was 33 years ago. I knew it was dead then. It's really dead now. I hit Linda uh, while we were singing, and I reminded her, aren't you glad you're not at the old church you used to be? I am so glad I'm not at the old dead church why? Because Jesus is great at raising dead things. Do you have any dead people in your family? They don't get it. They're just dead. Aren't you glad we have a Savior who knows how to take corpses and raise the dead? You might have something dead in you tonight. By the way, you might have a part of your body that's dead. You know, God knows how to fix that too if he wants to. You believe that? I believe it. I got a dead part and God can fix it. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Grace Church, on Wednesday night, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We're one day closer to like, woo, when he raises the dead. Or takes us home. Until then, enjoy the Lord. Serve the Lord. Live for the Lord. Be the light on the hill. Amen. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you as I have stood by the graveside many, many times, Lord. Absent from the body is present with the Lord if they're in you. 
But that body, Lord, you'll still raise that body. As my body gets old and tired and one day will fall over. Thank you that I'll be in the very presence of God. I'm not going to die. Oh, but this body will have to go to the grave. will have to go to the ground. The seed will have to be planted so it can be raised. Incorruptible. Immortal. Celestial. For your glory. Thank you that there's that, that one aspect of the rapture where, boy, you could come at any time. That'd be sweet. Right now would be great. If everybody here is ready, if they're not ready, I hope they get ready. So that, Lord, all of us can rejoice in the victory of Jesus Christ, not waiting to have everlasting life. We, I've already got everlasting life in Christ. I'm not going to die because I'm alive in Christ. For all the other things, Lord, that are dead in my life and some people that I know and some things I have and places I, I'd love to see life, please, Lord, come with your power. Let us see tonight how Jesus is the expert at raising dead things and people. If there's anybody dead in the room tonight, Lord, spiritually, I pray today would be the day that you just call them. They would respond today to you, Lord. And not just um, bumping up against Jesus, but connecting with the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that tonight. Then the ones in the room, Lord, they're wounded, they're hurt, they're suffering, they're in grief. They're fearful. Would you resurrect new life, just a fresh breath to them, I pray. So I thank you for Wednesday night. Thank you for this time, Lord, and the sermon that now will happen. All for the glory of Jesus and all of God's people would say. Okay, everybody, we are in the Gospel of Luke. We're walking through the Gospel of Luke. Made it all the way to chapter 8 in verse 40. That's on page 1192 of a seatback Bible. And look, at we got Jesus back where Jesus needs to be. He wasn't up there a minute ago. So way to go, Todd. Yeah, amen. Amen. You, you want to make sure Jesus is always where he's supposed to be. You think I'm joking. By the way, Jesus is always at the center of everything. But many times we're not. And then you get all messed up. You think, what's wrong? Well, somehow you're, you're not where Jesus is. So you got to go find him. Go, just go find him. Now, sometimes he comes and finds you, like the demoniac there living amongst the tombs, and Jesus crossed the lake. He crossed the lake for one guy. You know, everybody else has given up on him. He's living in the graveyard. They can't shackle him or bind him. He, he's got over 2,000 demons in him. And Jesus goes and finds him. What's he do? He resurrects that, that man out of that demonic body. Then the man wants to follow him. And Jesus said, no, go tell all your friends. What I'm ashamed of is that all the, the people there in the gatherings, they asked him to leave. If you ask Jesus to leave, he'll leave. That's why you got to be careful to make sure that he's not just on the center of the slide, that he's the center of your life. Because you say no to him so many times, you know what? He might not come back. You say, no, he might not come back. So you, you always want to welcome the Lord. Can I hear an amen? amen. And in case you think, I, I don't know where he is. Well, go find him. If you ever come to this church and Jesus isn't here, go find where he went. No, I'm going to stay here because it's my tradition. Forget your tradition. Go find Jesus. Amen. Are you tracking with me? Because yeah. you, you need not just resurrected everlasting life. You need resurrected life like now. I do. I got all these other dead things that, you know, people or places or stuff. I, I need the Lord. You ready? Luke chapter 8, verse 40. They asked him to leave, so he did. And so it was when Jesus returned. He's back across the lake to Capernaum. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him. Can I hear you say welcomed him? And uh, for they were all waiting for him. He left the multitude, went across for the one guy, and they said, hey, you can get out of here. The one guy wants to follow. So he comes back, and he finds a bunch of people waiting for him. Amen. You guys are here on a Wednesday night. Most, I'm glad you're here. Do you know what? Because in a way, we're waiting for Jesus. Right? You say, no, I just came in to see the pretty whatever. Mm, there is no pretty whatever here. <laughs> We're waiting for Jesus. I congratulate you. That multitude welcomed him. They were all waiting for him. And behold, there with the multitude, all the people, they're welcoming Jesus. Behold, there came a man named Jairus. 
Jairus, he was a ruler of the synagogue. Now, back then, a ruler of the synagogue, and in Capernaum, if you ever go with me to Israel, they, that's, that synagogue is still there, the ruins of that synagogue. And one of the rulers, one of the pastors of that synagogue is a man named Jairus. Jesus has already done all kinds of miracles there, but he's actually a Jew, a ruler of the synagogue. He's kind of, but he's desperate. He fell on his, he fell down on, excuse me, he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Can I hear you say dying? dying. Jarius, a pastor, a ruler of the synagogue. Can I see the picture of me and my pastor? Uh, Gordon Schroeder called me to Amarillo in 1980. He was the pastor of Paramount Community Church that got really, really upset with him. That is the most Jesus-like man I've ever known in my life. I mean, gentle, mild shepherd is that man, Gordon Schroeder. But that church went crazy. I mean, they went crazy. And basically, he got fired. I stayed at the church for his sake. And they still stayed crazy. And then it got so crazy that finally I decided they wanted to make me pastor of that crazy church that I finally decided to go to a gas station, basically a gas station, lock shop, and start Grace Church 33 years ago with a Bible and 17 people. And here we are 33 years later, blah, blah, blah. But what I'm saying is that that's my pastor. That's my pastor. Jarius was the pastor, the ruler of a synagogue for many people, and, but everything seemed to be going fine for him. He has a 12-year-old daughter. Remember what it's like when you have your baby girl? You know, I got a baby girl, and I'll tell you what, so my baby girl was here for Thanksgiving, and so like when you just talk about, she, she used to be 12, now she's like 30, she's 33. How do you know that? She was the first baby born in our church, the very first baby born in our church a month after church, so she's 33, which means she'll be 34, which means I'm in trouble because they're probably listening to this in Fredericksburg, Virginia right now. Anyways, I love my baby girl. Can I tell you, Jarius loved his only daughter, and for 12 years, you know, Christmas and Thanksgiving, they didn't call it that back then, but anyway, they celebrated, and there she is, everything's fine, and he's a pastor, things are fine, and then this guy shows up, and he doesn't have any credentials. By the way, Jesus had no credentials. He's a renegade rabbi. He doesn't come from the Sanhedrin, doesn't come from the Sadducees. I mean, who is this guy? And so Jerry saw all of this, and I don't know where he was in it. He hasn't shown up yet until all of a sudden, his baby girl. He's like sick, like really sick, really, really sick. She's dying. And he's already seen miracles happen in his synagogue. He's already seen miracles happen with Peter, who lives right around the corner from that synagogue. He's already heard sermons. And he knows if there's any hope, if there's any hope, I got to get to Jesus. And I got to get Jesus to come to my house. If I can get Jesus to come to my house, then maybe my baby girl, my 12 year old daughter, she'll have a shot. Hey, Jarius, don't you remember what happened in chapter 7 when the centurion had a servant that was sick? And the centurion sent other servants to have Jesus come. And then the Caesarean sent another message. You don't even need to come to my house. Matter of fact, if you just say the word, my servant will be healed. You don't have to come. And Jesus said that centurion, that Gentile soldier, centurion, had great faith, greater faith. Jesus was awestruck, amazed at his faith. He said, I haven't seen like faith like that in all of Israel. Hey, 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 Jarius. Why, why are you asking Jesus to come to your house? Why don't you be a, a man of great faith like the centurion? Do you know why? Because he wasn't. That should encourage you. It doesn't take great faith for Jesus to do something. It only takes a mustard seed of faith. 
And if you start comparing yourself to others in the story already, you might get discouraged. That Jew, that Jarius, that synagogue ruler is still expressing faith. Maybe not as great as a centurion, but it's faith. And isn't it amazing? Jesus is going to make a house call. Woohoo! Anybody here old enough to remember when doctors would make house calls? Somebody's sick. I can remember way back in Pennsylvania, way back, I was sick and lived way back on a farm. And the doctor came out into the country and made a house call just to make sure he's okay. I, I can't imagine what that would cost today, but back then. Don't you love Jesus? You just have to have a little faith. Not great faith. Oh, you can grow in your faith. And great faith is great faith. But he says, hey, Lord, he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. He fell down just like the demoniac fell down before him. And he begged him just like the demons had begged Jesus in the last story that we saw two weeks ago to come to his house. For he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. He had a great, great 12 years. Things were going good, and it, it can change overnight. Your life can change overnight. But as he went, amen that Jesus is going. He's going to Jairus' house. As he went, the multitudes, and I, I really believe it's thousands of people. As he went, the multitudes thronged him. That, that's a very specific Greek word. There are so many people they're suffocating him. We could actually bring that word suffocating. And, and I, I don't know if you've ever been in a crowd like that. I can remember sometimes way back in high school, there'd be so many kids trying to get into one spot going through you know, a door, and then you've got like hundreds trying to go through those two doors and to where it's like, okay. It's like you feel like you're suffocating. I can remember coming out of a Bronco game at Mile High Stadium, and you know everybody kind of, it kind of filters in coming in, but when it's over, they all go out at once, and it's kind of like, will you do that? Okay, go out with the crowd. I'd love it to be at church like that sometime. Like, there's so many people here, but I'm grateful for all the people we have. Amen? Amen? You say, I don't want somebody sitting next to me. Oh, hold on. We're praying that there's lots of people sitting next to you someday. But anyways, there's so many people around him that it's like suffocating. They're going with the crowd. There's lots and lots and lots of people. Where are they going? Well, they're going to Jerry's house. Why? Because his daughter is dying. How old is she? She's 12 years old. But as he went, the multitudes thronged, thronged about him. Verse 43, now a woman, she's not named. Jerry is his name, but this woman's not named. Now a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years. Can I hear you say 12 years? 12 years. She's hemorrhaging for 12 years. Well, Jerry's his daughter is learning how to walk. She's bleeding. When she's going to first grade, learning how to read and write, she's still bleeding. Jerry's his daughter is dying. This woman is slowly, slowly dying for 12 years. A woman having a flow of blood, a flow of blood for 12 years. She had spent, who spent all of her livelihood. She'd taken all the money she had in the bank, all the money that she had, all the money she could find. Who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians. Physicians. Could not be healed by any. You ever get really sick and go to the doctor? You spend the whole wad you got and then you hope it works and it makes you worse. That's why they're practicing medicine. <laughs> Can you imagine how she feels? Strike number one, she's a woman. 
In our culture, we really don't understand how bad that was for women back then. They didn't get to talk to the rabbi. They didn't get to touch a rabbi. They, they didn't, they'd have to sit on one side of the synagogue. They really, 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 really were like servants then. It's one thing to go on your cycle, but when your cycle doesn't stop, I don't mean to get too graphic, but you know, that's dead blood. It's dead. The daughter's dying. The woman's already been dead. She's bleeding out. Strike number two. Strike number three, now you're unclean. Nobody can touch you. Nobody, you can't touch anybody. According to the law, you're unclean. You don't get to go to church. You don't get to hold hands. You don't get, no, no, no. And then make it worse. Now, I don't know about her rabbi, could be Jarius, but I'm telling you what, there are rabbis back in her day that would say, the reason why you're bleeding so bad is you must be unfaithful. Now I'm getting mad. We got pastors running around today trying to blame whatever's happened to you because you must have done something. You must not have enough faith. You must have been wrong somewhere and that's why you're sick. And that makes me mad. Because sometimes you just get sick because you just get sick. That hurt. <laughs> so she's bleeding. She spent all her money. If she was married, she ain't married no more because she hadn't been able to be with her husband. And if that whole thing with the rabbi went down, he's already divorced her. She can't go to church. She's got no hope. And she's bleeding out. Can I tell you? She is slowly, slowly, slowly dying. But I got somebody in the middle of the story that's really an expert at raising dead things. Whether it's a demoniac living in the tombs, a daughter that's dying and will die, or somebody slowly dying because parts of their bodies just don't work right no more. And somewhere she had to do the math. What should I do? She came to one conclusion. I got to get to Jesus. I got to find him and I got to get to him. And I can't tell anybody what I'm doing because everybody's already thrown me away. I'm already unclean. And so maybe, maybe, maybe if I can just somehow find him. Guess how you find Jesus? He, he happens to like to hang out with his people. He's in the center of the multitude. And as they're making a way to do the next miracle at Jerry's house, she, she, I bet he's in the middle of all those people. I have got to get to Jesus. And there's already so many around him, but she's going to figure out a way. Probably low and slow. She is just going to, you know, I don't know, but she's just going to go low and work her way through. Can, can, can you see it? Can you, if, if, if I can just get to him, I don't need to have a conversation with him. I'm not trying to bring my knee. I, 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 I just got to touch him. I just got to touch him. And I got to say, now, now where, did, where did you get that? Where, what story did you read? When did he do this touchy, touchy thing before? Where did you learn that? She didn't. She just came up with it. Isn't that cool? By the way, the centurion had great faith. Jarius had faith. The woman had just enough faith. Probably mixed in with a little bit of superstition. But she had faith. Aren't you, do you, do you see what I'm saying? Aren't you glad that you don't have to pass some kind of test? It's just, you're, what is your faith in? It's gotta be in Christ. It's in Christ. So here she is, she got no hope. It's been 12 years who'd spent all her livelihood on physicians, could not be healed by any, came from behind. So she's sneaking in from behind and touched the border of his garment, which technically that would be one of the tassels. So she, she's coming up behind him. She doesn't want anybody to see. Uh, you know, <laughs> she's bleeding and she's weak 
And she works her way in from behind. And they're at the bottom. So that's why she, she just, and she, if you can picture, she just reaches out like this. By the way, that's all you got to do is. Ah! No, I, I thought you got to have like, like a sermon or some big prayer or some kind. No. By the way, how long does that take? Don't you love that God can save you just like that? Amen. I was upside down on a motorcycle and realized somehow I got, I, got to, I got to touch him. Now watch what happens. I, I know you know the story. So uh, she came up from behind, touched the border of his garment. Immediately the flow of blood, immediately her flow of blood stopped. Can I hear an Amen. How long did it take? Like, that long. 12 years of bleeding. 12 years of pain. 12 years of, of that stench. 12 years of ugly. 12 years of hope. And then, boom, just like that, it stopped. She's healed. And, and she somehow knew it. Like, something. What was that? Now, remember, she's incognito. Remember, there's... Thousands of people. I mean, there's people all around him. Jesus said, who touched me? Who touched me? And when all denied it, I mean, he started looking around. He stopped. And he, who touched me? Who touched me? And they all deny it. Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng, they're suffocating you, and they press you, and you say, who touched me? Now, there goes Peter again. That's Peter's way of saying, Lord, do you know what you're talking about? Everybody's touching you. There's people all around and touching you. And you stop in the middle of narrow and say, who touched me? Peter, now, Lord, we're all touching you. No. You're all bumping into me. You're all bumping into me. But there's somebody here who touched me. And there's a difference. You can go to church and bump into Jesus. That happened all the time. That ain't the same way as touching the Lord Jesus. You can have contact with Jesus and not be connected to Jesus. There's a difference. Well, I bumped into him a couple times. You know the old man upstairs? Listen, you don't know my Savior. Because when you reach out and touch him, everything changes. And he knows. And you know when that happens. You might say, well, hey, Lord, you should lighten up and just be easy on her for a little while. You know, she's been an outcast and bleeding. Nobody's talked to her. And then you stop in the middle of thousands of people. Who touched me? You're going to scare her. You're going to embarrass her. By the way, Jesus never wants to embarrass anybody. Maybe there's something bigger than her quiet Spirit. Verse 46. But Jesus said, somebody touched me. For I perceived power going out from me. Now you got to know Jesus knows exactly what's going on. But somebody, and I, th I think the way Mark's gospel defines it, as he's looking around the crowd, finally he looks right at her. But somebody touched me. I felt the power go out for me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden. Remember when that happened to you? Like I can just hide out. I don't have to tell anybody. And then the Lord kind of calls you out. And you say, no, I just wanted to sneak in. I, I didn't want anybody to know. And the Lord says, I know, and you know, and now everybody's going to know. Yeah. 
I don't want everybody to know. No, I want everybody to know. What does the Lord want everybody to know? First of all, he wants the woman to know you've been healed. This is not a coincidence. It's not coming back. You have been healed. When the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, oh Lord, and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. You're not supposed to be touching a man. You're never supposed to be touching a rabbi. You've been bleeding out and everybody knows that you're a bleeder. And she thought she was in big trouble. But by the way, she's already been healed. She's not a bleeder any longer. And she is a woman. Aren't you glad, ladies, you can touch the Lord Jesus? And he can touch you. So she had to confess before everyone. In the presence of all the people, the reason that she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. By the way, guess who's really nervous at this time in the story? Jarius, my daughter's dying. We don't have time for you to stop here and have this whole game with your disciples and the multitude and this lady. Couldn't we, couldn't we do her after you take care of my daughter? She's dying. By the way, the blessing of her getting healed and confessing that was not just for her, but also for Jarius. You see, for Jarius, the story's gonna get worse. So Jarius needs to know he is in the presence of someone that just with the touch of his garment can be healed. And by the way, it wasn't just for the woman and Jairus. It was also for the whole multitude. All these people that are bumping into Jesus have to figure out, I think we need to touch Jesus, be connected to him. By the way, that story, her getting called out, wasn't just for that multitude. It was for this multitude. Aren't you glad the story's there and that there's something about when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord? There's something about that. That ain't just about you. It's about everybody else watching you and maybe your story later that you don't even know about. God knows what he's doing. But can I tell you, it's for an extra, extra blessing for her. See, all she wanted was just this body part of me that's dead. Can you fix it so I don't bleed anymore? Well, that's easy. But there's a bigger part that needs to be fixed. And that's your soul. So when Jesus calls her out, notice what he says next. And he said to her, daughter, can I hear you say daughter? Now, the whole story started with Jairus' daughter, and now here's Jesus calling her daughter. This woman that's a bleeder is now being called daughter. Be of good cheer. Your faith, your faith, as small as it is, touching my, my garment, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. See, we read that way too quickly. What you wouldn't know unless you walked through the entire Bible. That is the only time in your New Testament where you have Jesus calling a woman daughter. Today we would say it, I would say it, baby girl. I only got one baby girl. And she knows, well, I got some grand girls, grand kid girls or granddaughters, that's what I'm trying to say. Once in a while, I'll call them baby girl too. But I don't call anybody, I mean, I'm, Katrina's my baby girl. She's my baby girl. And when Jesus called this woman, baby girl, your faith has made you well. It's kind of like, once, once you name somebody, so about 10 days ago, I had this unique problem in my house, and we had a spider, a daddy long leg, living in our bathtub. I don't know how long he or she, I don't know if it was a he or she, was living there, but we'll call him a him. And then before long, there was two of them. <laughs> uh oh <laughs> So we got two daddy long legs. Okay, so it wasn't a brown recluse and it wasn't a uh, 
widow. What am I thinking of? A black widow. One black widow. He's a daddy long leg. Come on, come on. I used to play with her. And so they were just hanging out in, this is our spare bathroom, and they're just hanging out in the bathtub. And for whatever reason, my dear wife let them live. And so they're just hanging out in the bathroom, you know, and uh, in the spare bathroom. And well, then <laughs> she named them. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> She named them Tom and Jerry. <laughs> and so, you know, I don't use the spare bathroom, so there they are, Tom and Jerry. And I'd heard this story. Well, then I, we have company. My, my daughter and her husband and my grandkids come for Thanksgiving. And so we got to use we got to use the tub. we got to use the spare bath, bathroom, and we're going to use it. So I went in there to take care of Tom and Jerry. Until I looked down close, she named them. Why did you have to go name them? How long they've been living in our house? If you guys only knew how many spiders I've squished in my life. But somehow, Tom and Jerry, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. I can't spray them. I can't just turn on the water quick. She named them. So I got a piece of tissue paper. I don't know if it was Tom or Jerry, but I kind of let Tom or Jerry climb up on the tissue paper and very carefully. Oh, it's too cold outside for Tom or Jerry, so I took them to the garage. <laughs> Put them on my workbench. Knock yourself out. <laughs> then I went back in to get Jerry, his best friend. I don't know. And I got Jerry and took him out to the workbench. And Tom and Jerry live happily ever after. You say you're making that up. No, I'm not. Last I saw, Tom and Jerry were just fine in my garage doing whatever Tom and Jerry want to do. Why didn't you squish them? Because they had names. Why didn't God just squish us? Why didn't God just squish us? Because he came to resurrect that new man, that new woman in you with a new name. He calls you daughter, son, baby girl. See, she just wanted to stop bleed, bleed. Her story goes down for everybody to know. Oh, he loves great faith. He loves faith. But he loves that little bitty tiny faith when you know there's nowhere else to go. I got no money, nobody but Jesus. Jerry says, forget about Tom and Jerry and forget about daughter. My daughter's dying. While he was still speaking, verse 49, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to Jerry, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. You know, it's difficult to believe God through deadness. Dougie, as he preached, by the way, my nephew preached a great sermon Sunday. And I think I got his quote right. Deadness is difficult to believe God through. It's really hard when you're at the graveside. It's really hard when all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's done. Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered Jerry as saying, Do not be afraid. Only believe. And she will be made well. You see, he just saw the miracle with the woman. 
and the hope that he had, the faith he had in Jesus coming to his house. And in the words of Jesus, do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. well how do you know if he did? Because they went on to his house. All he had to go on was the word of God, the words of Jesus. I'm banking on those same words. It's the word of God. It's the words of Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. When they came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. Those are professional mourners in that culture. They're there. They're wailing. They're screaming. I mean, the funeral's already started. And then Jesus says, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. They mocked him knowing that she was dead. To put it in context, that'd be like if I busted into Boxwell Brothers when they're already pulling out the blood and putting in all this stuff and saying, he is not dead. I'll tell you this, don't ever mock Jesus. They ridiculed him. They laughed at him. They scorned him. They mocked him, knowing that she was dead. Have you ever noticed that throughout the entire life of Jesus, there's always that group of people? That it, right here, it's, you know, with Jairus' daughter. Uh, at the cross, it was another group of people. I mean, at, at his birth. I mean, there's always people laughing at him. But he put them all outside. Who did he put outside? The people laughing at him. The people that mock Jesus and laugh at Jesus don't get to see the miracles of Jesus. There's people all over Amarillo. They're laughing at Jesus all the time. They're mocking God all this stuff all the time. They don't see the miracles happening around them all the time. The stars at night, the moon that comes up, another day closer, the word of God coming true right before our eyes. They don't, they don't see that. You know why? Because God puts them outside. They're so blind. So I don't laugh at God. Don't laugh at his word. He wants to show you some stuff. Like big stuff. He put them all outside, took her by the hand and called saying, little girl, <laughs> arise. Lord, don't you have to do something harder than that? Don't you need to pray or jump around or dance? or No. Just took her hand, little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned. She arose immediately. He commanded that she be given something to eat. I love that. She'd just been raised from the dead. Give her something to eat. She's hungry. By the way, when God raises you, give him something to eat. When, when, give him something to eat. Give him some milk of the word. Just give him some milk. Oh, then they'll grow up and they'll want some meat. Give him something to eat. By the way, if you came in here tonight and you've been resurrected, I'm trying to feed you. You should say, hey, that's a pretty good meal. We talked about a lot of stuff. What do I need to remember? Jesus needs to be in the middle of your life. And he's an expert at raising all of the dead things. And the biggest thing is you. He commanded that she be given something to eat. Her parents were astonished. <laughs> Boy, that's putting it mildly. Her parents were astonished. But he charged them not to tell no one what had happened. It's not his time yet. A lot of miracles he does in private. But not for anybody else to know yet. Don't you love the Lord? What do you mean she's sleeping? Well, she's just sleeping. No, she's dead. No, she's sleeping. She's dead. Well, when you say dead is dead to you, but to me, dead is just sleeping. Well, which is it? No, you're dead, but you're just sleeping. By the way, believers never die. We just fall asleep. You say, how do you know that? First Thessalonians 4, I read ahead. Look at First Thessalonians 4. Have to go there. Page 1358. I only need four minutes, I think. Page 1358, First Thessalonians 4, verse 13. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant. Don't be uninformed, brothers, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So when somebody close to you dies, notice the Bible doesn't say dies, it says fall asleep. You should say amen. amen. Why should you say amen? Because I try to go to sleep every night. I actually time myself, you know, like, okay, no caffeine. Okay, now I got to start relaxing. Okay, okay. And I take my vitamins that I take. Okay, okay. Now I'm going to go lay down. Cindy's amazing. I can go to sleep in like 30 seconds if I time it. Why do you do that? I like to sleep. <laughs> Did you know dying in Jesus is like that? It's like falling asleep. I actually want to fall asleep at night. I want to fall asleep. Not now, Lord, not now, but if, it, if it's my time, that's fine. Don't you love that you don't have to be afraid of death? I'm not afraid of death. I'm going to fall asleep in Jesus. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow, don't grieve as others who have no hope. We do sorrow, but not like the world. We have hope because they're asleep in Jesus. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, I believe that, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. That means it's official. This we say to you by the word of the Lord. That we, notice Paul expected the rapture in his lifetime. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord will himself descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, Dun, da, da, dun, da, da, da. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Can I hear an amen? amen? Then we, Paul thought he'd be a part of this, that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's where we get the word rapture. That we will be caught up together to meet them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So if, if somebody falls asleep in Jesus, they're dead in Jesus, their body's buried, their soul is already in the presence, but they need the body back, they're going to be resurrected. And one day when the rapture, I mean, when this resurrection happened, well, <clears throat> we go first and they come right up. Or they go first, then we go up. That's why I should have said that. They go first, but it's so quick. It's boom, boom. I mean, that's even slow to say it that way. It's bang. And we'll go, what just happened? Well, we're in the air. In the air, not on the ground. When he comes a second time, he touches down the Mount of Olives. I'll show you that if you go with me to Israel. That's the second coming when he touches down. But this is, he doesn't touch down. We meet him in the air. Hey, Bill, you're scaring me. No, you should be comforted. You got a loved one that died? Well, they're not in the ground. They're there, but the body's going to be raised. And there's, I would love to be doing a funeral. When the rapture happens, think about it. <laughs> well, I've said this so many times at the graveside, so many times. That's why it says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Encourage one another. Jesus is an expert at raising dead things. You say, well, your grandfather's been dead how long? A long time. Buried in Orlando, Florida. Your grandmother Long time, buried in Orlando, Florida. A brother-in-law buried up in Michigan. Hundreds of people in our church. They're not at Lown, though. They're not at Memory Garden. They're with the Lord. And one day, they'll be resurrected bodily, their soul, their spirit, their temporary body in heaven will get a celestial body from that seed that's been planted in the ground. And boom, they get the, the body. Yes. But then for some of us, if that would happen, which is why I really want it to happen, it'd be great if it happens before tomorrow because I've got to go to another funeral tomorrow. Can I see the picture of my pastor? Lord took him home. I 
I know he's okay. He'd come and visit from Dallas. He'd always find me. He's so proud of this church. He has three daughters. But that man there called me son. I'm so glad. I know the resurrection and the life. And I am so glad that that man there knew him as well. So tomorrow morning early, I'll drive to Dallas. I'll hug his wife and his daughters that were in my youth group 40, well, 38 years ago. And we'll be one day closer to Jesus. I hope you know my Lord. He said, well, I came into church. Well, I know you came into church. You probably bumped into Jesus too. But did you touch him? Are you connected to him? When your father dies, do you know him? Maybe you got dead friends around you or kids. I still write their names in my Bible. I wrote names in my Bible today. Lord, Lord, please. Love you guys. Thank you for loving my Savior. We're one day closer. So let us keep working and keep celebrating and keep letting the light shine. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He keeps track of all of it. One day, he's going to come, or he's going to call you home. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Father, thank you for your word today. I pray for my friend's family, Lord, for Gordon. I pray for his family and ask you to bless. I pray the service tomorrow would represent you well, as well as the memories of Gordon and comfort to his family. But I pray the gospel would be preached and people could be saved. Thank you, Lord. The gospel's been preached tonight that the Lord Jesus took my place on that tree. My sin, my penalty, your wrath was poured out on my Savior. And he conquered it. Amen for the resurrection and the life. And the way he shows up, Lord, and the way we connect to him, I pray that everyone in this room would have a direct connection with Jesus Christ. Some with great faith, others with faith, and some with just that mustard seed of a touch of faith. That you would call us sons and daughters. Baby girl. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your direction to each one here. Your encouragement or your conviction, Lord, we thank you. Just thank you for your word. The ones that need to be saved, I pray that they would do business with God right now. The ones encouraged, the ones that need to repent. That, Lord, when we walk out of here tonight, we would walk out with good cheer and comfort with Jesus. We love you, Lord. Thank you for first loving us. It's in the sweet name of our Savior and God's people would say, love you guys. <laughs>